on Life and Meaning is brought to you by Blumenthal Performing Arts, celebrating its 25th year presenting the best in the performing arts, sharing and employing the arts as a major catalyst to strengthen education, building community cohesiveness, and advancing economic growth. Further support is provided by Foundation for the Carolinas, inspiring philanthropy and empowering individuals to create a better community. And by the Arts and Science Council, Charlotte Mecklenburg's resource hub and lead advocate for the regional cultural community, providing culture for all. I wake up every morning excited to be a part of an amazing city. You know, I left what many in in the world think to be the greatest city. This is just a this is just an amazing place. It's an amazing place at an amazing time when we're having these critical discussions where we're really unpacking what it is to be community. And I'm just enthralled by being in this place. I'm so excited to be a part of these discussions, which sometimes are arguments, <laughs> which sometimes are which sometimes are just lovely conversations. I, I just love being here and being able to contribute in the way that I have been blessed to do. Federico Rios is the International Business and Immigrant Integration Manager for the City of Charlotte. His work focuses on community outreach and improving systems to help immigrant newcomers thrive as residents. Previously, Federico was Program Director for the Northeast Learning Community and Newcomer Services for Communities and Schools in Charlotte. He has several years experience serving as a mental health professional in Charlotte and in New York City. Federico is a board member of the Leading on Opportunity Council and Communities in Schools in Charlotte. In this episode, we explore serving immigrant communities, false and true narratives, and optimism about equity and justice. I'm Mark Paris, and this is On Life and Meaning. Federico, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Federico, your title is International and Integration Manager in the Office of International Relations for the City of Charlotte. What does that mean? It's actually made concise. So it's International Business and Immigrant Integration Manager. We've shortened it to say it as International and Integration Manager. So I am the person that serves as a resource for the immigrant community in town and for the international business community. So I serve as a liaison. I serve as a touch point. I help communicate the needs of those community members to the city. And I ensure that as we are working to provide better systems of support, as we are working to provide better connectivity, that we are making sure that every voice is heard in our community, that we are not segmenting ourselves off from really important voices. The job really hinges on this concept of equity, ensuring that everyone can equally access a service or resource that the city of Charlotte provides. The position is a new one within the city. How did the position come about? It's a great question. So, uh, Mark, you actually have the report in front of you that kind of created the position. The city and its partners convene a task force to look at the immigrant integration efforts that are occurring in town and how we can better support those efforts, how we can work with our immigrant community members. I think it's important to acknowledge that there was a significant demographic shift in this city over a pretty short period of time. So. Just to dovetail this into another report that is pretty prominent in Charlotte, Raj Chetty, a researcher out of Harvard University, partnered with some other researchers out of UC Berkeley and mapped out where cities throughout the country were in regards to their ability to move from the lowest level of poverty to the highest level of wealth. That report that Dr. Chetty put out acknowledged that Charlotte was 50th out of 50 in the country for economic mobility. We were the worst large city in the country to move from the lowest rung of poverty to this highest rung of wealth. And so within that timetable, we were looking at what Dr. Chetty was really uh, mapping out was a birth cohort of individuals that were born between 1980 and 1982. 
So he's looking at the economic mobility of that birth cohort. The, the reason I bring this up is that in 1980, when you look at our census records, less than 1% of the population of the city of Charlotte were foreign-born individuals. By the time of the task force report, we're hovering somewhere between 15 to 20 percent. So by the time we get to 2012, 2013, we're hovering at somewhere between 15 to 20 percent of the population being foreign born. It's a dramatic shift in a really short period of time. And it's a shift that really speaks to a larger dynamic in Charlotte, that Charlotte had become this booming city that was attracting people from everywhere, including myself and you, Mark. <laughs> we came from other places and arrived into this welcoming, awesome space that attracted us for a number of reasons. And so when you look at this report, this report really detailed where Charlotte had maybe not hit the mark in regards to immigrant integration efforts and crafted a path said, here are some things that the city of Charlotte could do. Here are some things that partner organizations could do to better integrate its immigrant community and looked at best practices around the country. It looked at the specific dynamic of how Southeastern cities were welcoming immigrants because Southeastern cities had really become major gateways for immigrant communities starting in the late 90s through the 2000s. And so Charlotte wanted to position itself better to do this work. And so this report comes out uh, March of 2015, it is reported to the city council. And a number of things happen <laughs> after this report. Uh, noteworthy things in the city of Charlotte, like the, the death of Keith Lamont Scott, the ensuing uprising that occurred shortly thereafter. And at the time, we were in flux with leadership. So shortly after the report comes out, um, we changed city managers. A number of dynamics are occurring. Fairly early on in our current city manager's tenure as city manager, our current city manager being Marcus Jones, immigrants came out and forced to a city council meeting and basically shut down the proceedings. They wanted their voice heard. They wanted city council to understand that they wanted them to take a position on immigration. And one of the reasons they did step forward to be heard is because the leading on opportunity report that responded to the uprising did not really address immigrant concerns. Yeah. Thank you for mentioning that. So when you look at the Leading on Opportunity Report, it's an incredibly lengthy document, hundreds of pages. And I've heard this anecdotally. I can't say that I've tracked it myself. The word immigrant only appears twice in the entire report. And again, let's show some grace. <laughs> I'm a little biased because I'm a, I'm a member of the group that's tasked with bringing forward that report, being a part of the Leading on Opportunity Council, the board that has been put together to execute on that report. But they were tracking a birth cohort from 1980 to 1982, and we had less than a 1% foreign-born population. And so we can forgive them on that. And there was outreach. In fact, one of the largest outreach events to gather information from community was an event that was specifically tailored towards Spanish speakers in our community. One of the statements that I've heard said, and I can't, again, I can't substantiate, I wasn't in the room at the time, is that many of the individuals from that community did not want to figure prominently into a report that talked about poverty. And maybe we didn't have the right people asking the right questions at the time or understanding that context. I think for many immigrants, we also have to understand that U.S. poverty is vastly different from the poverty they may have experienced in their home country. And so they may not acknowledge it unless they're helped understand it or educated a bit more on the equity issues that are really prevalent here in Charlotte. So we are speaking about two reports. One report that talked about immigrant integration and a second report called the Leading on Opportunity Report that really had to do with a response to equity concerns in the African-American community. Your job comes along in response to the report about immigrant integration. Right. What was recommended in that report that led to your position being formed? So specifically around my position, it was not recommended that they hire an individual. It was recommended that they lift up an office of New Charlotteans. So the concept being, let's create the bandwidth within the city, the capacity to address the specific needs that newly arrived individuals encounter when they come to Charlotte um, so that they can better understand context, get better connected to resources and services. And when I say newly arrived individuals, I'm really speaking about new immigrants, immigrants that are coming for the first time to the U.S. and their first interaction being Charlotte. And so my position 
was really capacity building for an office that was already standing, the Office of International Relations, acknowledging that they needed somebody that could manage this work stream, that could work through the recommendations. So I'm uniquely placed. I am in Housing and Neighborhood Services because we recognize that the immigrant work occurs on the neighborhood level. Immigrants make up our schools, make up our houses of worship, make up our communities. And so I'm there, but I also have a dotted line straight to the city manager because the city manager wanted the immigrant community to know specifically that he wanted to be kept abreast of the challenges that they faced and wanted to find solutions to some of those challenges. Again, within our jurisdictional purview, there are some things that we just can't touch because they're beyond our reach. You have been on the job for 14 months now. Yes, sir. When you started the job 14 months ago, what did you expect would be the immediate focus of your work? Mm, That's a great question. I can't say that I knew with certainty all that I was getting into. I knew the report. I'd studied the report. I knew the challenges faced on community really from my prior work. So I think it's important to speak to my previous work thinking about this. But I think I walked into the role imagining that I would spend my time trying to come up with actionable solutions to some of the challenges that were presented in the report and then take into account the report was crafted in 2015. I come online in 2018. We're under two different presidential administrations. A lot changed in regards to immigration policy. So a lot of what I do now with the report is having to shift it to address what our current needs are. So there's a lot more focus on the internal. What I recognized pretty early on in my role is that we did not have the systems in place to best support the immigrant community member. So for instance, a city as large as Charlotte, a city that since the 90s has experienced an influx of immigrants, has yet to establish a citywide language access plan. So when we think of issues of equity, if I spoke Hmong, and I picked up the phone today and called 311. 311 would be able to get me someone on the line that could speak Hmong to me to address my issue. The challenge comes in when 311 connects me to that other division. So if my issue is I have a pothole in front of my house and they try to connect me to CDOT, CDOT may not know how to access language line, may not know how to get an interpreter quickly to address my need. And so on a city that is really mindful about how we deal with issues of equity, this issue had not bubbled up to the point where we were proactively addressing it. That might be the case with Hmong. Yeah. Is it the case with Spanish? Spanish were much better equipped. And that's just from a population perspective. Our largest immigrant base are Spanish speakers. I think extrapolating a bit of what you're saying and maybe adding a bend to it, I think a lot of people say that and assume, well, we have Spanish speakers, so we're okay. But there are so many other immigrants in our community and that other immigrant population, those individuals from the continent of Africa, from Southeast Asia, from France and Germany, and our European immigrant population typically speaks English. But when we think of those individuals, they deserve access readily just as much as you and I do. They should be able to access a service as quickly as you and I do because they're residents of the same community. Your view is the city should be able to respond to whatever language a resident uses to contact the city? Absolutely. And that's not my view alone. It's the view of the federal government. So what's interesting in relation to our conversation around language access is that the city of Greensboro had been audited for not having a citywide language access plan. And that audit leads to being fined. So a city our size should really be mindful of this because the federal government expects that we offer our services to all of our residents, irrespective of the language that they speak. Are you spending your time and energy on what you think you should be spending your time and energy on? I do believe so. So I probably stopped midstream when I was talking about the two different types of work. So there's the internal work focusing on something like the language access plan, looking at propping up an ambassador program where we're cultivating the language skill sets of individuals within the bounds of the city of Charlotte. So we have 8,000 employees. Many of those speak other languages. And we've never taken a proactive step to gather the information of all the languages that are spoken and offer them the opportunity to volunteer in community to represent the city of Charlotte at events, at festivals, at different programs. So that's the internal side. The other side is the external side. So building relationship with community members, 
helping to understand what their needs are and systemically where the gaps are. Probably going out on a limb here by saying this, but I don't think anyone has set up any policy with the idea that they want to exclude in this day and age. I think what invariably happens is that people don't have everyone in the room or haven't heard every voice and invariably exclude because of that. And so getting in front of community members, building relationships with them, understanding their complex needs and challenges, and being able to, one, have a voice that goes directly back to the head of the business of the city, which is the city manager, and being able to say, hey, this system, the way we have this set up, it invariably negatively impacts our community. How can we address this so that we don't have this barrier any longer? I think that's where I get great joy in doing that. I get great joy in building relationships with community members and saying, how can I help? I think if, if you go back a bit in my personal story, I've always wanted to help. And so having the opportunity to do that and then figure out how do we improve the system or how do we create the system where one may not exist to best address those needs. That's my work streams. And so, yes, I love what I'm doing and I'm grateful for the opportunity to do it. I think I am, I'm happier now than when I first started the job, even though the days can be tough and very long and challenging. It, it's just great work. Are you spending the time you thought you might be spending on the international business side? No, I didn't expect to spend as much time. The good thing about me coming into the city is that we had a incredibly capable, talented individual that was already working in that space, Alexis Gordon, and I get to work alongside her. She leads many of those efforts and she's housed in economic development, but works in tandem with our office. And so from my perspective, the international business realm is actually going really well. What's interesting is there's been some changes and shifts within economic development, more capacity building for that office that will ensure that not only will we be able to address the needs that currently exist, but we'll be able to create systems and processes that will improve things even more down the road. Federico, are you a staff of one? (laughs) <laughs> I'm not a staff of one. This is great because I get to talk about all the amazing people I work with. So I get to work with Emily Yaffe. Emily is amazing. She's our international specialist and she's built a lot of these relationships already. Interestingly enough, Emily and I got to know each other a year before I came on with the city. She invited me out to be a moderator for an event that she was conducting. And instantly I liked her. And I joke with her all the time that I think she just did that, knowing that this position would one day open up and try to reel me in for it, and she won. So again, it's what it's what makes the job a joy, working around people that really are passionate about this issue, passionate about serving their fellow community members. Very the sure. Immigrant Integration Task Force identified the top 10 concerns of immigrants. Is your work actually attending to those concerns? So that's the interesting thing about this space, right? When you look at these recommendations, they were broad. And they're not all city specific. So what's really interesting is that we are setting up a system and then working in tandem with key partners, whether that's goodwill to ensure that they know how to best attract residents that may not speak English as their first language, other immigrant groups. I've been pulled in by CMS's magnet office that has been open in saying, hey, we want to attract more Spanish speakers and we don't know how to do that. Help us work through a system. So a lot of my work isn't just changing systems within the city. But offering up my expertise, and I I say expertise lightly, I don't feel that I'm an expert in anything, but being able to offer support and advice to other organizations as they think through how to better serve their immigrant community. So yes, I am tasked with doing multiple things out of this report. Some of those things have changed. So specifically, one of the asks has been around municipal IDs. After this report came out, the state actually made it illegal for municipalities to issue identifications. So I have to work around that. So I have to unpack the new reality, right? This is the system we live in. This is how law functions here. So in instances like like the municipal ID instance, what I end up having to do is figure out, well, how do I get more mobile consulates to come to town so individuals have passports? Why is that important? If I'm driving a car without a driver's license, again, you can't have a driver's license if you're an undocumented person in the state of North Carolina and I don't have another form of ID, I'm immediately arrested. If I have a passport, I'm cited. Why is that important? If I'm arrested, there's always the potential that I could end up in the deportation process. If I'm cited, it doesn't have to go to that level. I'm just cited. So it's my job to see what the need is and cultivate a solution 
without incurring the wrath of not following law. I have to follow the law. But it's more circuitous than I think people imagine. It's not a straight line oftentimes to address the need. Federico, you said that there is a false narrative about immigrants in Charlotte. Yes. What is that false narrative? I'd broaden it out. I wouldn't say that it's just a false narrative about immigrants in Charlotte. I think it's a false narrative about immigrants. I think the thought is that immigrants come to take, that immigrants have come here for economic reasons only, and that they take jobs, they take benefits that they should not be afforded, that they create crime, and there is data that refutes that at every end. There are narratives that refute that constantly. My personal experience with the immigrant community is that it is an incredibly hardworking community. It is a community that has come here to live out the American ideal, which is to support its family, to provide for itself, to be a benefit to community and, and its fellow citizenry. And so that it's a flawed narrative. It's us saying that people have not come here to give their best. It's, it's always challenging because you recognize that immigrant community members are impacted by the narrative and almost to a degree feel that they have to counter the narrative by being doubly good, by being more than just normal people that are here to do their work, support their families, provide for themselves and their community. And so you, you feel the repercussions of it. You sense that anxiousness, that tension and you have to work through that. You have to show people that, no, we appreciate you for who you are, for what you bring, for how much you enrich the lives of, of all the residents of Charlotte. If there is a narrative about immigration that is not positive, it's a narrative that challenges undocumented immigration, not immigration on the whole mm -hmm. that is legal and that has contributed to the American narrative for 300 years. Now, there is a distinction in the narrative between embracing immigration and not being in favor of a flow of undocumented immigrants into the United States. I think the narrative around the undocumented population is a nuance captured in a much longer narrative about immigration as a whole. So if we think about this contextually from Ellis Island till now, people were angry at all new people when they came because they were new people. There's been a nativist response yeah. against immigration, but there has also been a general embrace of immigrants as well. Sure, over time. So when you look at the history of the U.S. between 1920 and 19, 1920s, I can't pinpoint a, a year, and 1965, we basically closed our borders. We said we did not want people to come. The 1965 Immigration Act changes things. Now, the 1965 Immigration Act came out in part as an immigration response to the civil rights issue, the broader civil rights issue. And when you look at that, that's when we see a drastic demographic shift in this country. Even when you look at how the 1965 Immigration Act came to be, Democrats at the time pushed for skilled, highly skilled immigrants. Democrats wanted highly skilled Republicans said, no, we want family migration. We want individuals that are tied to family members. That is the complete opposite of what we hear in today's narrative. Why is that? Because Republicans at the time anticipated that because the immigrant base that we had gotten were Eastern Europeans and other Europeans, that they would continue to get white immigrants. The issue became when we started getting brown and black immigrants. So oftentimes the immigration debate, the issue with the immigration debate is a race issue. It's not so much a who's good, who's bad. It's a what do they look like and how do they fall into the context of what I believe to be American. I think that ends up being a cornerstone in this idea of legality. Because first of all, crossing the Mexican-American border is a civil offense. It's not a criminal offense. It's a civil matter. That's why individuals that go before immigration court are not afforded an attorney like you and I would be if we committed a crime. You know, this idea of legality, I think, oftentimes can serve as a thinly veiled question of race and who's coming. There are many more Europeans that overstay their visas. There are many more individuals from other parts of the world that have fairer skin 
that are not plunged into the, th the concept of legality versus illegality. At the same time, someone who has concerns about our immigration patterns should not be called a racist. No, and I wouldn't. I think, I, so here's the thing, there's, there's... That delegitimizes public discourse on an important topic. And I, I completely concur. I would not say that anyone is racist. I, said, I would say that the system that is in place has to be evaluated to determine what factor does race play in it. And I think it plays a prominent factor. To be transparent, the same questions of race arise outside of the United States. This is not just a U.S. issue either. And when we think of the drivers of migration and who ends up here, race plays a major factor in that as well. There's a reason why the Central American populations that arrive are typically indigenous persons versus Caucasian persons. There's a reason why the same is the case with Mexican populations. There's a reason why African descendants from both of those places don't end up here in the numbers that other groups do. And so we have to take all of that into context. I really think it's us really looking to evaluate the whole of the system, the drivers included. The thought of legality and illegality, we also have to take into account what we've done in regards to our policies in this country, the imperialism that, was, that the US government enacted for an extended period of time that has documented history in Central America and the Caribbean and in other places, that has impacted these regions and has been a part of the driver that forces people to leave. No one wants to leave. That's another part of this argument around legality. No one necessarily wants to leave where they live. Everyone loves being where they're from. There's things that drive them for having to leave. You and I are from Queens, New York. I would have loved it, thinking back to my time leaving Queens, if I could have stayed in Queens. I couldn't afford to stay in Queens. There's many people that are from Guadalajara, Mexico. Same case. They would have loved to have stayed in Guadalajara, but the circumstances did not allow for it, and so migration was, became a necessity. Are you an advocate for more open borders for immigration from Central America? I am an advocate for immigration reform. I don't know that open borders would solve anything. I think more has to be done from a political end to ensure that the drivers of immigration are not continuing to drive people to leave the places that are their homes. Are you an advocate for amnesty for undocumented immigrants? I think there needs to be a path towards citizenship. I wouldn't say amnesty. I think that's a path that could be a taxable path. I think that's a path that could take a number of, number of different courses of action. I believe that if you're here, you're productive, you're providing for our community, then we should have a really good discussion on whether or not we can afford you the opportunity to become officially a part of this community. Do your views on national immigration policies influence how you go about your work as a municipal employee? I think it influences it to the fact that I have to stay informed to acknowledge what's happening on the ground. I don't think it influences it from the perspective of politically I think this and therefore I can't work for you. The greatest thing about working for the city of Charlotte is that I get to be nonpartisan. I get to work with everyone. I get to see them for their value and their worth and not affix some type of party designation to them. I get to see them for who they are, what they represent, and what it is they need. But do your personal views lead you to not fully complying with national immigration policy? Oh, absolutely not. I have to comply with national <laughs> immigration policy. I have no choice. I would do more damage than good if I went against national immigration policy. Again, I'm trying to serve the whole of our community. So doing that would serve me and this community no benefit. What excites you about the work that you are doing? I wake up every morning excited to be a part of an amazing city. You know, I left what many in, in the world think to be the greatest city. This is just a, this is just an amazing place. It's an amazing place at an amazing time when we're having these critical discussions where we're really unpacking what it is to be community. And I'm just enthralled by being in this place. I'm so excited to be a part of these discussions, which sometimes are arguments, <laughs> which sometimes are which sometimes are just lovely conversations. I, I just love being here and being able to contribute in the way that I have been blessed to do. Federico, let's talk about your life and career. You mentioned sure. Queens, New York many times. What is the Queens <laughs> you remembered as a child? Wow. 
So I'm from South Ozone Park, Queens. I grew up right outside of JFK Airport. My mom worked at the airport for Sky Chefs Lufthansa doing food preparation. And my my dad had a really horrible accident when I was five years old. He fell into a condensation tank full of burning hot water and oil. He was working at the YMCA at the time. And so that left him permanently disabled. But we didn't lack for things in the sense that we had food, we had clothes. My parents on what was an incredibly limited income provided my brother and I the opportunity to go to private school, kindergarten through eighth grade. So we went to um, St. Anthony of Padua School, which was on the block I grew up on. And so I remember, I remember amazing friends that I have to this day. Both of my best friends I made in elementary school, one the first day of kindergarten. And I remember just a loving environment but I also remember this constant sense of danger. I grew up in the crack era in Queens. And so all around me, there was, there was always a sense of something could happen. So I grew up in, in the community, uh, you're from Queens, you may know this, uh, that where Edward Byrne, the police officer, was shot and killed. I grew up in a, in a place that has a storied past, but... Thank God that violence never impacted me directly, but it definitely colored my view of the world, left me a little bit jaded. And growing up in poverty was incredibly difficult. And it, it, it impacts how you see the world. It, it affects your brain chemistry. And But I, I, I had no greater example than, than a mom that woke up every morning and busted her behind to provide for us. And so the, going back to the, the conversation around the value of immigrants and, and that, my, my mother gave her life, gave her life to ensure that her family, her children had better than she had. And I mean, she, she made our community a better place. My mother is a quiet immigrant in the sense that, I don't even know that she calls herself an immigrant. My mother <laughs> says she's from here because she's been here longer than she was there is her statement. But she doesn't, she doesn't make a big to do about anything. This summer she fell very ill and had to have an emergency surgery. And as she was being taken out of our home on a stretcher, she said she saw so many neighbors just standing around and asking questions. And she felt loved. She felt like people cared about her. And I don't know that she always knew that people cared about her in that way, but it's evidence of this sense of community. And so when you ask the question, what was Queens like? What is Queens still like? I have to go back fairly regularly due to my parents' ailments. It was a loving place where community was always looking out for you, always taking care of you. And I take that with me everywhere I go. Federico, what did your parents teach you? Work hard, uh, give your very best. My parents never said college was an option. It was an absolute necessity. They knew nothing about what that meant. My father's a sixth grade dropout. And we think sixth grade. I, I can't ever pinpoint a time but and my mom completed high school in Columbia which was more of a trade based program from my understanding and they came here knowing that they had to work hard again my my dad was disabled but he found a way to provide for us and they just they wanted for me more than than I could have imagined for myself so they said no you have to go to college you have to get an education that's the only way you make it in this country who did you want to be in high school in high school, I had no clue what I wanted to do. In college, I had no clue what I wanted to do. It wasn't until after then. I understand there was someone who was very important in helping you complete your studies in college. Right. So I didn't know what I wanted to do in high school. I applied to colleges not really knowing what I was doing. I ended up getting to one school. I went to Hofstra University for a year. I didn't work out. as incredibly prohibitively expensive. Parents couldn't afford it. They maxed out loans on me. Second year, I went to St. Francis College in downtown Brooklyn, got my grades up, paid for it out of pocket myself. So I went to school and worked full time to do that. And then my third year, I finally found the school I wanted to go to. I wanted to go to Stony Brook. And I, I wasn't allowed to get a loan unless I found a cosigner that weren't my parents because they were already taxed out. And so I reached out to my cousin Gabriel. My cousin Gabe's the oldest of the cousins. And I asked him if he could please cosign on the loan. And he said that he could not. He and his wife, Emmy, had just had a baby. They had just bought a co-op. Their credit was all tied up and they he couldn't do that. And so I didn't know what I was going to do. A couple of weeks later, after that call, September 11th happens. Sadly, 
his wife Emmy was in the second tower of the World Trade Center. And so I I my roommate found a way to get me back home. And that night, the night of September 11th, got to Gabe's house. Gabe didn't get there till later on in the evening. And I said, I'll stay. You know, I was in college. I figured no one's going to be mad if I don't attend some classes. And so I stayed. I don't even know if it was days or weeks. It's such a blur. But I stayed there and I helped answer the phone and went and dropped off Emmy's dental records to the to the armory where people were doing that. I posted flyers showing her and her best friend went around to hospitals looking for her. And um, sadly, she never came home. And we had a memorial service and I went back to school. And I didn't really think about, it never clicked like, oh, you got to pay for school. (laughs) And then when it did click, I remember my cousin Gabe calling me and saying, Freddie, you know, I don't even remember the details. I just know that through the insurance policy that he had on Emmy, Gabe called me and said, I will pay for the rest of your college education. So I'm here uh, because of that. Uh, I got the education that my parents desperately wanted me to have because of it. And I feel permanently indebted to him and and to his daughter. Um, you know, it, it's, it's amazing to know that in the midst of a crisis and the what was probably the worst moment I had ever experienced in family, something so humbling and beautiful could happen. What has his generosity meant for you since? I, was, I, I mean, Gabe's generosity has meant the world for me because his generosity has meant the world to me, obviously, because I'm I'm where I am because of him. He jokes that I need to give him my degree. And so, you know, Gabe has done it all. In regards to Emmy, who, I mean, was family, but was a great friend when she didn't have to be, that she didn't have to impress me. She was marrying into the family, but... I was nobody worthy of being impressed. She always went out of her way to love me. Emmy held the door open for her coworkers at Fiduciary Trust. So people that survived that day remember her serving them. And so to this day, I'm trying to live out that example. I'm trying to serve in spite of whatever risk I might take on myself. I want to give myself over to people. I want to, I'm, I'm a, I'm a Christian. I I want to I want to show what love looks like. You earned a degree in English. Yeah. Why English? I loved reading and um writing writing uh creative stories. And so I figured I could get a degree in that pretty easily. I had no clue what I wanted to do in college. And what happened after college? So I said I'm a Christian. A good friend of mine in, in church actually told me you should come you should come work where I work and so I went and interviewed and went through a training actually with one of my best friends and my wife we all trained at the same place together we worked at a residential facility with 125 boys in Syosset New York called Mercy First it was a residential facility that housed um, juvenile delinquents children that were wards of the Office of Mental Health in New York foster care children and um, sexual offenders and it changed my life it was service it was I think what everything that had happened preceding that was leading me towards, it was serving people who oftentimes don't have a voice, serving people, and and at that time, young people, which most of my career has been serving young people. It was serving individuals that needed somebody to advocate for them, but not drown out their voice, just amplify what it is they wanted to say. How long were you there? Three and a half years. I also worked for a very, very short time as a New York City teaching fellow while in New York as well. So those two those two experiences definitely led me to where I am. In 2007, you decided to leave New York. Mm-hmm. Why? So at the time, my wife and I were working four jobs between two of us, and we were overwhelmed. <laughs> she was pregnant with our first son, and it's just, it was an overwhelming time. We just didn't know what next steps we wanted to take. My wife did not want to live in an apartment in the sky, in tight living quarters, with no access to a vehicle. So we both made a decision to leave everything we knew on faith. We also felt that God was was moving us in a direction, and so we went with it. 
it was one of the scariest things I've ever done in my life, but it has proven itself to be the best thing. And so when I feel God tell me to do something, when the Holy Spirit is leading me to something, I just do it. And sometimes that takes longer than others, but I've learned that there's great things behind what he asks. So, How did you find your way to Charlotte? The person who became my brother-in-law at the time, he was just starting to date my sister-in-law, my wife's twin. When he heard that we wanted to leave, he said, hey, come check Charlotte out. And so we did, and my wife, my wife really enjoyed it. I don't think I was as big a fan, but again, I was reluctantly following God's directive and wanting to stay married. And so we came here, and I hated it probably for the first three years. It took me a long time to adjust to a new cultural context. It took me a long time to build relationships. I had a really rough go at it my first couple of years, so I lost three jobs within a two-year span. And in New York, I steadily climbed the ladder. And so I came crashing down here. So here I was, someone with a college degree, somebody that was bilingual, um, and I was on food stamps. My wife and I were on food stamps. And I mean, it was an incredibly humbling experience. But again, God has a way of doing things. How could I ever speak for individuals if I hadn't experienced it myself? It's only recently that I began talking about my adult poverty. I was never bothered by talking about my childhood poverty because that's not my fault. I'm a kid. And the circumstances that happened in my family were not anyone's fault. They were accident. But when it came to adult poverty, I just I never wanted to talk about it. It wasn't until the Leading on Opportunity report actually came out that I grew comfortable enough to share publicly that we had gone through some really difficult moments. And that's helped me know how to serve people that find themselves in those situations because I myself was there. I deserve dignity and respect just like everybody else. I had a lot going for me like many others. My particular station in life at that moment did not mean that I was any less than anyone else. You began to work at community and schools and you worked there for eight years. What was your experience? Best job I could have ever had at the time. So communities and schools, I, I didn't have relationships for the first couple of years I'm here in Charlotte. Communities and schools offered me a world of relationships. It connected me in a way that I couldn't have asked for a better setup. So my first job with communities and schools was serving as a site coordinator at Hidden Valley Elementary, Go Eagles. Hidden Valley is a magical place on the north side of town that has encountered a number of challenges that are not dissimilar from the experience I had growing up in Queens. Many of the families were newly arrived immigrant families. There was also a historic African-American population that lived there. And so a dichotomy that I was very familiar with because I grew up in it, I got to serve in that role and connect people to resources and services and broker important exchanges. And communities and schools was just an amazing place to land. So having that opportunity first and then moving up to being a program manager and helping to be for my employees what I wanted my supervisor to be when I was uh, on the ground. Again, it, it, it all boiled down to servants, to being a servant leader, to being serviceable, and to addressing the needs of a larger community. And so, I mean, every door possible opened for me there. I did a TED Talk through communities and schools, through my relationship with Molly Shaw. She asked that I do one. And Molly has been an amazing part of my life. She has put me on platforms and extended social capital for me. And again, built relationships there. My best friend here in Charlotte is Shantique Neely, the executive director of A Child's Place, who we met while we were both in communities and schools. And so just the richness and variety of relationships and connections that I made there, I don't think I could have asked for anything better than that. And that led to your current position at the city? Yes, sir. Federico, you are doing public service work. You are working across the community, both with international business, labor, and immigrants. You have built a strong professional network of contacts and community leaders. You have a powerful personal story. And you are a great public speaker. Do you have an interest in public office? So I've been told to never say never. But at the moment, no. I really am enjoying working for the city in this capacity. I don't feel that my voice is needed at the moment. I think there's more than enough people saying the same things I would probably say in that role. So I'm 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 okay. I'm also mindful. I'm very pragmatic. I shared this with you earlier. 
most of my career, I've worked two jobs. And that's a lot. Our elected officials go through a lot, having to manage that plus their personal and family relationships and everything else. I'm okay not doing that at the moment. I want to dedicate the time that my family deserves to it, especially now my, my children are 12 and 11. And, well, they will be 12 and 11. They're 11 and 10. They deserve to have daddy available. Are you optimistic about equity and justice in America? Yes. I don't think I could legitimately serve if I wasn't. This would just be far too depressing a role if I didn't think that anything that I was putting my mind, my my effort, my energy towards would not be able to achieve a tangible result. So I am incredibly optimistic. I do think that we are in a, just an amazing time and we will look back one day at this and say, wow, look how far we've come, but also look at, look at what was made out of this moment. What's most important to you? I think I spoke to this a little bit. The most important thing to me is to be a good representative for God, to show the love that's been extended to me, the grace, the mercy that's been extended to me, to care for my family and by extension, my community. I want my children to one day say, oh, my dad was involved in that. When they overhear somebody's conversation they, they can of something positive that's happened in Charlotte, I want them to say, oh, my dad was, used to be involved in that. My dad had something to do with that. That would mean the world to me, to leave a legacy of service and to say that I did that because of my relationship with Christ and wanting to serve out that relationship in community and public service. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Federico Rios is the International and Integration Manager for the City of Charlotte. He earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in English from the State University of New York at Stony Brook. And now, a personal word. Immigration is a defining political and cultural issue of our day. It is drawing lines and boundaries. It is determining the future of children and families. It is shaping nations and history. Immigration is also the most personal of conversations. We are an immigrant or the descendant of one. Each of us has a story about how we came to this land, and we are protective, if not defensive, about that story. Federico Rios has his own story. His father is from Puerto Rico, his mother is from Colombia. His parents worked hard to provide for him. He grew up in Queens, New York, a place with working class immigrants from every nation in the world. Think of a language, a religion, an ethnicity, and you will find it in Queens. Everyone is tossed together. The streets define diversity. Later in life, Federico emigrated to Charlotte. He left his home for someplace new a city far more homogenous and segregated, a city with different challenges and its own codes, a place large and small enough where social capital can make all the difference. When Federico arrived, he didn't like Charlotte very much. The city was foreign to him, until he found good work, until he made friends, until his colleagues opened doors for him. Federico is a perfect advocate for the international community in Charlotte. He has struggled and persevered. He is culturally sensitive and adept. He understands hope and aspiration. He is an ambassador for newcomers and an ambassador for the city. Federico noted that over the last 30 years, there's been a dramatic increase in the number of immigrant families in Charlotte. Most of these immigrant newcomers have come from Latin America. He asserts that the United States has historically welcomed white Europeans, but anti-immigrant sentiment has risen because of a racist response to poor and brown people. My guess is that there are other factors involved too in the complex response to immigration. In the April 2019 issue of The Atlantic, 
In an article entitled, If Liberals Won't Enforce Borders, Fascists Will, staff writer David Frum explores what we are getting right and wrong in the debate. It's a long analysis, but here are just a few of his points. Immigration is accelerating rapidly. From 1990 to 2015, 44 million people left the Global South to find new homes in the Global North. About 11 to 12 million people live in the United States without documentation. By 2027, the foreign-born proportion of the U.S. population is projected to be at its all-time peak of nearly 15%, with that percentage rising to new records thereafter. Contrary to most narratives, immigration is increasing because life on our planet is improving for most people. Hundreds of millions of people have been lifted into a new global striver class who want even more economic opportunity. The vast number of people who are immigrating are strivers who want a better life for themselves. They want to leave their homes and become Americans. Our immigration policies are a patchwork of laws that are incoherent. Asylum in the United States was originally designed for refugees fleeing fascism and communism in the aftermath of World War II. Today, asylum seekers assert that they are fleeing crime and terror in their home countries. Yet asylum seeking has surged even as crime in Central America has decreased precipitously. The United States rose to its greatest heights between the years 1915 to 1965, when immigration was its slowest and most measured. As immigration has accelerated since, so has economic dislocation of the working class, and the country seems to have splintered this is apart. Mark Paris, and you've been listening to the number of future potential immigrants. Thank you to my partners, Andy Go, and producer of the show, and to Chris Curtin, in the years art ahead, and media director. Tens of millions of people this is will how want you to can become help. Americans. Please write a review Organizing on iTunes. and pushing at our, our audience, overwhelming us on nearly Facebook. every We'd social love to hear what you think about the show, nation. and become a patron. Demagogues we are on Patreon, rise, a crowdsourcing about platform issues that allows you to conventional leaders what you value. Unwilling, visit us also on our website on life and throughout the developed world. Thank you for right-wing listening. populism is rising in response to left-wing accommodation of massive waves of immigration. In his article, David Frum repeatedly points out the many benefits of immigration, from Nobel Prize laureates to the launch of new corporations to enrichment of culture. He is clear that we are a better and richer nation because immigrants come here. His point is is that there are false narratives on both sides of the debate. It is too simple to say that people who want to reform and reduce immigration are motivated by race. It's too easy an accusation, even if partially true. It disregards real existential facts on the ground that thoughtful people are seeing and seeking to discuss. Frum concludes that we are more likely to fulfill promises of equal opportunity and mutual respect if we are more considered about who and how many people we embrace as new Americans. We are more likely to cohere as a nation. My parents emigrated here from South America. I am a first-generation American. As a young child, I lived in Queens, New York. That is part of my story. Federico Rios and I have much in common. But our stories are part of a much larger story of out of many, one. This is Mark Paris, and you've been listening to On Life and Meaning. Thank you to my partners, Andy Goh, producer of the show, and to Chris Curriton, art and media director. This is how you can help. Please write a review on iTunes. It helps us grow our audience. Follow us on Facebook. We'd love to hear what you think about the show. And become a patron. We are on Patreon, a crowdsourcing platform that allows you to support what you value. Visit us also on our website on lifeandmeaning.com. Thank you for listening.